Welcome. Uh, this is the uh, final uh, lecture of the semester in the Courage to Be uh, lecture series. And uh, I'm very excited um, that you all had the chance to uh, experience these three lectures, or the last one will come today. I think the, the fact that we've had an artist, a, a photographer, uh, a, a pastor, and, and now a, a, a filmmaker and activist of sorts, if that's a fair uh, of sorts, of sorts. Yes. Um, you know, is, is, is indicative of the range of, of people that we try to bring for this series. I mean, we've had Gandhi scholars, we've had police brutality activists, um, we've, we've had human rights activists uh, doing, doing work. It's, it's really an amazing series, and I want to thank all the students, the Hunter Arendt Center fellows, who um, really put an enormous amount of work and effort into this over the last uh, six months putting it together. Um, we have different kinds of Hannah Arendt Center fellows, so uh, the, the main fellows are these fellows who do the Courage to Be program, and we, we always look forward to having people apply who've been through the courses, that'll be in the next fall. But we also have um, these Tough Talks fellows, some of you have been to some of our Tough Talks, uh, and those are talks that are related, are part of the Courage to Be project. They're, part, they're talks that bring in speakers that are outside of the barred mainstream, main ideas that try and bring different views to campus. And we're going to be bringing in a new Courage to Be, new Tough Talk Fellows for next fall uh, to run the program. We have a meeting tomorrow at 5.30 at the RN Center um, for anyone who might be interested in participating in or applying to be one of the Tough Talk Fellows for, for next year. It's a paid position, um, and we would uh, hope that anyone who is interested would come to 5.30 tomorrow at the Hannah Arendt Center. Um, well, this is the last of the um, Courage to Be lecture series. We still have three upcoming dinner conversations on Courage. Uh, and April 9th uh, uh, on the Conscious Pariah with me, uh, April 11th with uh, Rabbi um, uh, uh, David Nelson on Courage and Piety, and April 25th, Moral and Intellectual Courage uh, with Michelle Dominey. So um, I encourage you to get in touch with the fellows or with Tina Stanton, our at Bard at EDU, and sign up for, for one of those dinners. Um, as I've, over the years of running the RN Center, we've had, as you know, many conferences, many difficult discussions. Um, there are two that are probably the most difficult. Right? One is anything around Israel and Palestine. Um, it's shocking to me still how, why in this country that is such a hard conversation, but it is. Uh, and the other is around race. Um, and. Uh, I, I think we're going to be talking about that tonight, so I, I encourage you all to be courageous and thoughtful in, in asking questions of our speaker. Uh, let me, though, as, as the practice here, introduce uh, the two uh, RN Center fellows who uh, have worked to bring our speaker here tonight. Um, the first is, is Rachel Braver. She's a first-year student in human rights. And the second is Maeve Schauer, a uh, second year student, uh, part of the Bard Conservatory, and a student in philosophy. So please, please welcome Rachel and Maeve. Thank you, Roger, for the introduction. How do we face a racial identity if we cannot get outside the American racial paradigm? Whitney Dow is looking to find the answer to this question through filmmaking. In this quest, she has taken on a vast responsibility. Dow recognizes the responsibility that comes with discussing the topic of identity, both in how his own self-identity affects the art and how he represents the identities of his subjects through art. He courageously faces this responsibility in all of his projects. Whitney Dow has an impressive career as a documentary filmmaker and has worked with creative partner and co-director Marco Williams to create such films as Two Towns of Jasper and Banished, as well as independent projects, including When the Drum is Be Beating and I Sit Where I Want, The Legacy of Brown versus Board of Education. These films face problems that most are too timid to tackle. Um, 
Whitney, along with Marco, courageously face these issues head on. Whether exploring the same subject through different lenses or accurately depicting previously misrepresented information, the pair pose incredibly important questions that are often left unasked. After a seventh grader asked Dow what he had learned about his own racial identity through these projects, Dow realized that he had not thought about it and that, it, that this is a preeminent problem among white people. This realization prompted the creation of his most recent endeavor, The Whiteness Project, which asks white people of all different ages, political standings, and social statuses to question what it means to them to be white. This project has been lauded and questioned, but clearly serves to make these humans aware of the intrinsic importance of, the, of their race that serves for their benefit every day. Dow works to remind both himself and other people that they are not outside the American racial paradigm, that it is a truth that they must face every day. Dow is working to challenge the internal racial structure of our society, and he's doing so by creating a platform for questioning and reflection. This project offers space for us to courageously ref reflect in our own awareness and finally ask the unasked questions that keep us from facing ourselves, our identity. Humans of Bard, please welcome Whitney Dow. First of all, thank you, uh, Rachel, thank you, Maeve. Uh, thank you, all the ARNT fellows. I mean, this is a very intimidating uh, talk to have to give because you're, you're speaking to people who've actually asked you to come. Normally, the university foists me upon the students, and so they don't, they're, so I don't, so I don't really feel, if they don't like me, I don't really feel that badly about it. But I, I am concerned because the person who nominated me to come speak, Paris, uh, I, I learned that she nominated me, they immediately decided to go to Berlin to take, uh, take, uh, uh, take her a semester there so that she has no responsibility for anything that happens. Um, this, this is also um, an intimidating uh, talk to give because there's a, you know, being asked to give this and there's big questions that the art center is asking that as if I have answers. And it's hard because my work throughout my career has always been driven by the lack of answers, questions. And that I've, everything I've, everything I've ever done has sort of been based on the fact that I don't know things and that I've used my work to try and get to that understanding. But I think the questions um, that, that were asked like when, that, when I got the invitation were, um, there were, there were four questions. Why do some people have the courage to resist evil while others meekly go along with the actions they know to be morally wrong? Well, if I had the answer to that question, I, I would be giving a speech you know, for, for, the, for, the, for, the no, for the Peace Prize, not for the Hand Art Center. So I'm totally unqualified to answer that question. <laughs> the, the second question, I feel a little, how are we to nurture spiritual and moral courage in the face of a world increasingly beset by impersonal and bureaucratic systems of evil? I'm going to attempt to answer part of that question. Um, it, well, you, you can determine if, I'm good, if, 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 I, if I do a good job of it. The third one is, where can we find the courage to be advocates for good in a world where the incentives lead us to turn quiet, quietly away? And I'm going to start by saying that I totally disagree with the premise of that question. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. And the last one I'm equally unqualified to answer, which is how can a liberal arts college nurture the courage to be? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking about how to, how to start this, because I want to I talk about narratives. But I thought the best way to start this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this talk was with a story. That may not seem instructive, but it will be in a second. There's a man. One day, traveling through the Scottish Highlands. You may have heard this before. And he was traveling through, and he came upon this beautiful town, this town that's on a lock with a, with, a, with a pier and a little pub. And he was feeling thirsty, so he decided to stop and get a drink. And he stopped in the bar, this beautiful bar with a beautiful carved bar, and there was a barkeep behind there, so a very typical Scottish looking fellow. Okay, I'm not even going to try and do a Scottish accent, so you have to bear with me. So he came up and he asked him what he, if he'd like a drink and he brought him a beer and he brought some beers and he sat there. And the barkeep looked like he wanted to talk and he said, I just want to introduce myself. Said the barkeep, my name is Fergus, do you like this bar? And I said, yeah, I do. He said, 
I built this bar with my bare hands. I carved woods, it was beautiful carvings. I carved it, I conceived it. I created a space for my community to come and sit and talk and share with each other their experience of being members of this community. But do you think they call me Fergus the bar builder? The bar builder? They don't. So he said, he didn't really know quite to make this, so he sort of started drinking his beer and he, Look out the window there. Do you see those? Do you see those walls? All those walls. Before I, those walls, I built those walls with my bare hands. Before that, the sheep used to run wild across the hill. I would go and I and I dug the rocks and I laid them out. I leveled them and I've transformed the community by building these walls and giving a place for the sheep to be. He said, "Well, that's." But do you think they call me Fergus, the wall builder? They don't. Look out that window. Do you see the pier? Before there, before, there was no pier. There's nobody to place their boats. No, no way that they, the fishermen could bring their catch. I went into the forest. I cut the trees. I dragged the trees down to the... But I built the pier. I created a place. The community now is a place of commerce. Place like, but do you think they call me Fergus, the pier builder? They don't. But I fucked one pig. <laughs> now, how is that instructive? <laughs> Well, <laughs> we all have narratives about ourselves. We all have journeys. Okay, <laughs> This man had a, had, a, had a narrative about himself, and the world did not see him in that narrative. And I think that's kind of what we all face. We all have a road we're traveling. We all have the narratives we live in. And one of the things about my work that I've always been really interested in is sort of the intersection between how someone sees your, themselves and how they see the world and how the world actually is and how the world sees them. And the thing about narratives is that they're mutable. They change. And as you travel, as you, as you travel through life, there are moments that give you the opportunity to see the world differently. And there are moments that give you the opportunity to see yourself differently. And the key is to sort of be aware of those moments. Be aware that, that you have the opportunity to reimagine yourself and also reimagine the world. And so the, um, the, first, the first question of that, how do we nurture spiritual and moral courage? Let me see if I, I'm a little lost here. Hold on. So, how do, we, how do we nurture spiritual and moral courage in the face of a world increasingly beset by bureaucratic systems of evil? <clears throat> I, I think that there's essentially a simple answer to that. And that is that systems are made, our systems don't exist in a vacuum. Systems are made up of people. And so how do the actions you take on a day-to-day -day basis can change those systems? And that's sort of what my work has, tried, has been based on for the last 20 years, is trying to get people to see that their actions actually impact the paradigm, that not to see themselves inside the paradigm, but see them out, outside the paradigm trying to fix it, but actually in it, their actions take, take place. Now, my own narrative, I also want to say is, is that I think that you see someone like me up here as if giving you some sort of knowledge that, you know, I arrive like Athena out of <laughs> Zeus's head. And of course that's not the case. I, and I think that, how many of you got a chance to see Two Towns of Jasper? Did they? Oh, great, a good portion of you got to watch it. I want to confess something. I made that film uh, 
I made that film because I wanted to get more advertising work. And at the time I made the film, I was working in advertising and I was uh, selling liquor to children and you know, uh, I think one of my one of one of my clients was called Goldschlager and their 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 uh, I think their tagline was and when you're done, the bottle makes a great pillow. Um, it, it was really like the most horrible thing. And I noticed that, that, that there was sort of a movement in that time, in the late 90s, where that, that independent filmmakers were being, were getting advertising work. And I sort of, I, I wanted to make a film, and I, I saw this guy, Chris Smith, who made a film called American Movie, had been very successful, a documentary. I, and I had sort of grown up around my father produced ethnographic films. I, of course, like any good son, ran as far away from as possible and started to make advertising. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I need it. What are the films that are successful? Well, like, crimes are really successful. Uh, trials have built-in <clears throat> narrative engines. And so when I saw the news conference of the sheriff giving a news conference, Billy Rolls, who you saw in the film, the first news on TV, talking about the, drag, the murder of James Byrd. And I was like, this guy is a movie star. I'm going to go down and meet him. But something happened. I went down there. And I drove down the road where James Byrd had been dragged. And when you see the opening of the film, that's the, you're seeing the first frames of footage that I ever shot as a filmmaker. I was sitting on the hood of the rental car, and uh, my friend was sort of swerving around. I was trying to stay on. And we drove down the road, but as we drove, you see circle after circle where they found the body parts. And it went on and on, and we come to the end of the road, and you can see the implant of James Bird's body where he was left because he'd been dragged. He'd been so worn down that it was like he left an imprint on the ground of this headless, armless body. And that moment was so transformative to me. It shook me, it changed everything the way I saw about the world. Everything that I believed about myself and my place will change in that moment. And I determined in that moment, if I can do something that communicates to people how I feel right at this moment, I will have done something of value. And I didn't know what that was. I didn't know at that point I was going to be making a film with Marco, I was going to be making a film, but that experience, this is what I mean about being on a, on, a, on a journey, being able to step outside yourself and see when something opens up for you, changed everything for me. And I spent the next couple of years making that film with uh, Marco, and I was so transformed by the experience of trying to navigate the story, being with a friend I've known since I was 14, trying to understand and replicate a reality that was actually two separate realities in parallel. Um, that my dreams of being in advertising came crashing down, and I was left with this, uh, with this, with, with this crucible to carry forward. And now, 20 years later, I'm still making films. Um, so, one of the things that so I think that. Learn to see yourself who, for who you are, is sort of the first bit of knowledge, is that when you see this opportunity that you can take it, and these opportunities come into your, your life, and it's having that courage to say, okay, this is the path that I'm going to walk, despite what it's going to be. Now, the second, the second piece in that I really learned on this is that, and not seeing yourself, is seeing other people. And one of the people that... I really got to be close to during the making of Two Towns of Jasper was Trent, the white supremacist uh, guy. And I wanted to pull up, the, for those of you that didn't see it, let's see if I can get the tech working. Christine, how am I on time, Christine? And um, I learned a lesson from Trent from this scene. And I'm going to make, hopefully, that the audio will be. Uh... 
I got a lot of tattoos in prison. Every tattoo I have has to do with my heritage, some kind of way, Irish and Norse and Vikings. I was in the Aryan Circle, and I still am. This is the Celtic cross. It's typically what the skins used, to, the skinheads used to, to identify who they are. Along the side of my arms is, 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 is white power. It's what I believe in. White power says everything white pride says, as well as fuck you. A lot of white people are still with a guilt complex that they owe somebody something, and the black people can play that. Not all black people, not all white people, but that, that, that does happen a lot. And I would be willing to bet my job and all the money that I could possibly make next year that I could go into that cemetery where this prayer vigil is going on and I could look at these people and I can identify them and know who they are and I can meet them at a, at a club, I can meet them at a cafe or at a diner or at church and talk about black people, you know what I mean? And, uh, and, then, and, then, and then I find out that they're raised exactly like me that they don't really want to be around them, that they really, that they're okay, they're afraid of them, they are, they have a guilt thing ab about them, they feel like they may owe them something, they don't like that feeling, so they would rather be away from them. But when this thing kicks off, they run out there and they, they join this prayer vigil and they're holding hands and saying we're getting along, and it's really not true, it's all fake. And what I, what I really, really, really appreciated about Trent and what I learned from Trent in this moment sitting there is, I, is that it was much like the barkeep, is that people saw him a certain way. They saw him as this white supremacist, this dangerous society. He's actually like a Xerox copy of Bill King, the ringleader that killed James Byrd. But if you listen to him closely and listen to him with empathy, he doesn't say anything about negative, about black people. He's talking about himself. He talks about being feeling guilty and not liking that feeling. He talks about uh, not wanting to be around because he's afraid of black people. All these things, and it's very easy to project something on this person and say, oh, well, this person is, this person is a threat, this person is dangerous. What is he representing? But part of navigating, navigating your own narrative is listening to the people that you interact with. And I just, I, I, I you know, ultimately, um, when Trent is sort of one of the people that I return to all the time, we, we haven't been in touch in a few years, but we stayed in touch. He was the first person who called me on 9-11. You know, he was, we, we stayed in touch for a long time. And um, I always uh, sort of didn't really understand his motivations for participating in, in, because he kind of, in participating in the film, he kind of opened himself up and revealed himself to the community. Nobody knew that he was part of the Aryan Circle. And I ultimately asked him, I said, why Trump, why did you, why did you, um, why did you participate in the film? And he said, I thought a lot about this and I really thought that if I, if I, it, once I spoke to you, I could never go back. It was the way that I could, once I spoke to you on camera, I was gonna have to move forward in my life and leave this beyond. I didn't realize that at the time, but he took the control of his story, a story that the whole community was trying to put on him, and he changed, and he changed that narrative and moved forward from it. So, the, the next thing, I, I had my own, sort of, uh, well, sort of, I had my own sort of uh, barkeep story, and I think, I think it was Rachel or Maeve alluded to it um, in the speech, uh, in, in your introduction. I had made movies, I started making movies with Mark, we made Two Towns of Jasper, we made probably six or seven other films, all based on race. And in some way, they were about Brown versus Sports Education, or they were perhaps about um, you know, some, you know, uh, ethnic cleansing in post-Reconstruction America, but I was very, very, very focused on being someone who worked on issues that I cared deeply about, worked on trying to transform them through media that I was creating, and during that we wrote, we worked with a group called Facing History and Ourselves, we wrote curriculums for uh, high schools, we did tours across the country to colleges and things. And I was really, really comfortable in who I was. I was the sort of 
you know, I was a filmmaker, social justice warrior, making these things. And we were invited, Marco and I were invited to speak at the annual fundraiser for Facing History and Ourselves, uh, which is an organization that, that uh, produces all kinds of content around, um, they originally started as, an, as, an, as, a, as, a, as something that was anti-hate relating to the Holocaust, but now they have this huge network of schools. And they asked us, and there was, they asked us to be the speakers, and they structured it by having us being interviewed by a group of seventh graders. So it was probably six or seven hundred people, and, I, and black tie, and these, we were on this, I was on this dais, and feeling very pleased with myself at that point. And this little girl um, turned to me and said, she, well, she said, Whitney, what have you learned about your white identity working with Marco? And I had another one of those moments, those transformational moments, where I realized in that, in that moment that I wanted to say, wait a minute, I don't have a white identity. I have, I don't have an identity. My identity is Whitney Dow. I'm working on this, I, I'm sort of the, the fight, fighting for truth and justice in the American way and trying to, and at the same, I have this parallel conversation in my head saying, oh my God, I have the most powerful racial identity in America. And up until this seventh grade girl asked me that question, I had never really fundamentally understood it, understood that it was an active dynamic component that was interacting every moment of every day. And that moment where I was able to step outside myself and look at the narrative that I was telling myself and recognize it as false, fundamentally transformed my world in a way that I can't even describe. And this is where I get to that second question that I disagree with. Um, where can we find the courage to advocate for good in a world where the incentives lead us to turn quietly away? I don't think they lead you to turn quietly. I think actually the incentives, what I learned from that moment is that the incentives lead in the other direction. If you're able to turn and look at yourself, if you're able to see how you work in the world, it was like getting the red pill in the matrix. All of a sudden, I could see how all my relationships were built around this particular perception of myself, that I never saw myself the way people saw me. And it allowed me to fundamentally recognize that thing, this idea where I, the, 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 the question of, um, the bureaucratic system, seeing that I was not someone who was outside the paradigm. I was somebody inside the paradigm, and I suddenly felt this, things that seemed huge and out of my control, I felt incredible agency all over every single action that I took. I could change the dynamic of any, every interaction. If I changed that interaction, I was changing the paradigm. And I know that sounds like really friggin' corny, but you can actually see it, and I could, act, I could go into meetings and realize and start tracking who I looked at, who I talked to, who people talked to me. I would go into stores and I would see how, how I interact, how I related to the people behind the counter, how they related to me as a customer, looking like, I know I look like a caricature of a Northeastern white dude. I mean, I, rec I suddenly saw that this thing that I was carrying around was like impacting all these things. And that being, you know, like the, if, and I had the same experience um, that I had sitting in that road in Jasper. That moment I said, and being a filmmaker, I said, well, how can I actually give this experience to other white people? How can I create something in it that, how can I pick up, how can I speak to my own community? How can I be this person who brings this message to other people? And I tried for, but I, you know, this was probably six, seven years ago, and this was long before Donald Trump, long before discussions of whiteness were um, were so uh, were so sort of prevalent. And um, I uh, I got 
I got laughed out of every uh, foundation that ever funded me when I said I, I did, admittedly, I'd call the project for whites only at that point, and um, they weren't that interested in funding it. Um, but what I did is I just went out and started talking to white people. And I started interviewing people from all walks of life in many different cities. And, um, and realizing that many white people had never asked themselves the most fundamentally basic questions, like what is it that makes me white? Um, how would my life be different if I, if I weren't? What are, the, what, are the, um, what are the benefits of being white? What are the drawbacks of being white? And I had person after person sit down in front of me and not be able to answer these questions. So anyway, I led, what, I, what I ultimately um, got to, for those of you who haven't seen it, is I, I created something called the Whiteness Project. And um, the, the, this is, I think, that that last question of how can a liberal arts college nurture the grocery bag might have a beginning piece of that answer in this project. Because this particular segment that you're seeing, I've been to four or five cities. The project is now a project of Columbia University. It's a research project, which I'm not going to bore you with the details of. But this particular iteration you're seeing of, I went to Dallas, Texas, and I talked to all kinds of different people. And um, I was interested in how the relationship of whiteness work in complex uh, complex identities, people who are biracial, multiracial, how it worked with religion. And, you know, the one, one, of, one of the, one of the things that were, one of the, the things that were amazing, had these incredible discussions and meeting these people, and one of the people that I met um, was also somewhat like Trent for me. And that person sort of transformed the way that I saw the world. And this was this incredibly precocious 15-year-old. And I'm going to introduce you to them here. My identity as a person stems a lot from the queer community. Um, I'm non-binary, neither a male or a female. And I'm uh, pansexual and on the aromantic spectrum. And so you have that combined with a passion for the arts and humanities altogether. And it, I'm also just a nerd. So it's a weird concoction of interesting ideas. Being white definitely has value to me. I know that it gives me privilege. I know um, in a lot of sticky situations, I'd be offered second chances where others wouldn't. Um, I have a truancy case right now because I missed a lot of school. And um, I was the only white person in that court besides my mother. And um, I was also the last person to be called. So I got to watch all of the other kids go up there and the judge be like, so why did you miss school? Why are you skipping class? Why are you doing all these bad things with bad influences around you? You need to go get a job. And then I got up there and the judge was like, oh, all right, uh, you just need to do this. Here are these papers you're going to keep. Um, I suggest you get a job. Have a nice day. And that was all I got. And it was weird and a weird sort of one of the most obvious examples i have of how i'd benefit from white privilege but i know that there are a lot of little things where just people have assumptions about me based on looking at me and my skin tone definitely goes into that so hadley was one of the students that i met what's really interesting about hadley is that we, you know, we talked, we hit it off afterwards, and I put all these, these videos up online, and as you can imagine, once those things go online, there's all kinds, all hell breaks loose. And um, the, Hadley at that point, I think it was 15, and she, they really instructed me in how to, and we talked about courage, how to engage people and how to think of it. So if those of you who don't know, Hadley is here tonight. And Hadley is one of the reasons when I say that you're, you're you know, how can a liberal arts nurture courage? 
it's including people like Hadley in your community because I have such huge respect for them and the way that they approach their life. I'll give you some examples. One of the nice things that someone wrote was the commenter, bro, you have a dick or vagina. All I'm saying, you're a male or female. I don't care if you're gay or whatever, but if you were born with a dick, I will consider you male. Please get your passive aggressive bullshit out of here. Hadley's response, Close mindlessness limits perspective and can only mean the continuation of the status quo. Listen and learn before you take a firm stance. Thank you for being part of the conversation, education as well. Have a nice day. And included some helpful links on how to, to for articles on non-binaryism. So I think that that I think that Hadley showed me that there's that there's a that how you own your own story, how you engage that story, and how you then speak to people who are trying to recover you. Um, I think we're about at 20 minutes around. Okay, so I guess I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to... about myself and something that really kind of really after all the work I've done and everything I've done just to remind you that despite that I'm up here giving you received wisdom that it's a constant 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 process um, I go to the Cape in the summer with my family and my sister asked me to pick up a friend of hers at the airport and I went to pick up her friends who go pick up Iris, and I went to the airport, and, and she said, well, she's about 5'8", she's brown hair, brown eyes, you see her, she's there. I go to the airport, I'm looking around, I call, I don't see her. Penny, you know, I don't see Iris anywhere. She's there, and I said, what, what describe her, she's, you know, 5'8", brown hair, brown eyes. Now, you kind of know where the story is going, I'm guessing. She was standing right in front of me, but because she was black, I didn't see her. I didn't recognize her as that person that she was describing. And that was, again, a moment that totally transformed the way I, const I saw myself in the world, in a place, in a particular way, and recognized that the narrative I was telling myself about myself was not accurate and I need to change it. So, you know, I wanted, I wanted to close with another joke. Because actually, the person who came into the bar, and you can have to you figure out what, you have to figure out after I, what the what the what the message of this is, was actually not a person; it was a moth. And the bartender Ferguson said, "Well, you're a moth. What are you doing in a bar? Like, why did you why did you why did you come in here? You can't even I've noticed you can't even lift that beer. You're, you can't hold it. Your hands don't work. You have a fuzz." And the moth said, of course, the light was on. So I think that you don't know where you're going to find these moments. You don't know where you're going to find these stories. Move towards the light, and hopefully you'll find some for yourself.